Mm. Well, uh, hey, Clint, where are you? I can't see you, but um, can you tell them not to hammer? Okay, he's on it. Okay, thanks. There's always something exciting on, on a Friday morning. So uh, welcome everyone to Grand Rounds and thank you again for uh, coming and spending an hour learning more about medicine. And really today, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome back uh, one of our previous residents and chief residents who, in Michael, as Michael Lucy says, is a rising star uh, in the area of hepatology, Dr. Jessica Mellinger. So Dr. Mellinger is gonna be presenting grand rounds on alcohol-associated liver disease in the US, another disease of despair. Dr. Mellinger currently is an assistant professor in the Division of GI and Hepatology in the Department of Medicine at the University of Michigan Healthcare Systems. So as you know, I like to tell a little bit about people, and Dr. Mellinger has an incredibly impressive CV uh, for a uh, professor uh, beginning her career. So she was a medical, uh, she did her medical degree at University of Northwestern Feinstein School of Medicine. She, we were then lucky enough to have her come join us here for her residency, where she completed her chief year uh, in 2011. She then went on and has had her career at Michigan, where she did her GI fellowship, and during her GI fellowship, she was a chief fellow. She then went on and did a transplant hepatology fellowship there as well, and is currently uh, on faculty there as an assistant professor. She currently has a K-23 Career Development Award. She works in the area of liver transplant, and she already, since her fellowship, has uh, 31 articles, which is really quite amazing. So when looking over her awards, you know, some of these awards are uh, of, uh, in her area of, of, of research. Uh, in 2016, AS, AASDL uh, Clinical and Translational Research Award was given to her. She received the Outstanding Fellow Research Award in 2014 from the University of Michigan Division of Gastroenterology. And then perusing back over her CV over time, she was a Rhodes Scholar in 2000 to 2003, which I just think is incredibly impressive. So we are really looking forward to your grand rounds. Dr. Mellinger, please come on up. Thank you. I feel a little bit like Madonna with this on right now, so <laughs> try not to do any singing. Well, thank you so much for having me. I was telling uh, Dr. Lucy the other day that the last time that I was here um, at the university here was when I was a chief resident, and the last time I was in this auditorium, I was giving a ch uh, grand rounds as a chief on this topic. So we'll see exactly we'll see how things have changed over the past ten years. So I'm very fortunate to be back in Madison. I absolutely love it here. Uh, my residency years were uh, bar none some of the best years of my life and my career um, and just a wonderful wonderful place to be so um, and great cheese so it's really awesome to be back so um, I'm going to be speaking about alcohol associated liver disease um, calling it another disease of despair we're seeing a lot of this around the country opioid overdose increases in suicide increases in alcohol use however gets a little bit less attention alcohol research is not funded to the degree that opioid research is or that other research is um, and certainly within ALD we're seeing some trends that I'll go over um, to start off with but um, beginning with the epidemiology of ALD and a uh, AUD alcohol use disorder in the US we'll talk a little bit about some of the alarming trends that we're seeing I know here anecdotally um, we see it on our wards we we see a lot of young people with advanced alcohol-related liver disease, and that was actually what got me started in ALD research. Um, Dr. Lucy was my mentor when I was here. I had a foray away from ALD research in fellowship and then came back to it in my transplant year when my patients were just all dying. I was having to withdraw care on women in their, 20s, in their late 20s, early 30s, um, people with kids because they had advanced alcoholic liver disease and we couldn't do anything about it, and they were so young. And so I decided to, to uh, move all of my research into that area and see what we could do to help to make things better. So we'll talk about some of the reasons for the rise in ALD, why this might be happening, um, and then some of the challenges and opportunities in the fight against ALD. Um, so cirrhosis, alcohol-related cirrhosis, is actually really growing. And this was a study that we published using um, private insurance data set, a database. So this is really kind of the patients who have the highest socioeconomic status. They're more likely to be employed. And even amongst this cohort, in just seven years, we saw a rise of almost 40 percent, just over 40 percent, in diagnoses of alcohol-related cirrhosis. And that rise was really predominantly, or, or more, more so, in the young, who had a threefold increase 
Prevalence rates were low, but they tripled over that time frame. And then also in women, we saw increases greater than those of men, though men do still make up the bulk of the population with ALD. And then recently last year, um, uh, one of our, my colleagues at Michigan published a mortality study that looked at the national mortality for alcohol-associated cirrhosis and AED and kind of found a similar but even more alarming finding that young people were having greater increases in cirrhosis. Again, this is that 25 to 34, this is the millennial cohort. Um, greater percentage increases in cirrhosis, women more than men, but particularly look at the increase here for the, for the young, and we see women, 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 women having significantly more increases across those age strata. And then here, just alcohol-related disease in general, alcohol use disorders rising dramatically, ALD, even if it's not cirrhotic, rising, and cirrhosis rising as well amongst this young population. And this is a real change. Um, we're very used to seeing people in their 40s and 50s with alcohol-related liver disease, but what I hear across the country and what this data really bore out was that we are seeing younger and younger people coming in, having gotten their start drinking, drinking heavily from a very young age. We're talking age 10, 11, 12, and then accumulating a couple of decades worth of drinking and landing in the ICU with advanced liver disease. And this is reflected also now, of course, in transplant. This is the first, first data that we've seen so far that in the US, we now have ALD as our number one cause of liver disease. And this is, in some respect, a marker of the success of hepatitis C treatment. So hepatitis C antiviral treatment has been such a resounding success that we really are not transplanting very many people for hep C at all anymore. The rates have dropped dramatically even faster than we thought they were going to be dropping. And as a consequence, what is left is alcohol-related liver disease. Um, in 2011, there was a seminal pilot study published in the New England Journal, the Franco-Belgian an alcoholic hepatitis trial that showed that you could transplant patients who had acute alcoholic hepatitis with recent drinking, so within about a month or two, that were highly selected and they did well compared to other patients who had ALD or other causes of liver transplant. And so we see an increase also in liver transplants for alcoholic hepatitis happening across the country as well. So why is this happening? Drinking is rising, so there's several different reasons, but by and large, we're seeing more people drinking more heavily. Um, every five years or so, the NIAAA does a large epidemiologic survey on alcohol and related conditions, um, and they published their 2013 results uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and what we found is that across all demographics, across all age groups, across all racial and ethnic groups, across both genders, you see increases. So this is what they termed high-risk drinking, so people who are drinking more than four drinks a day for women, five for men, of standard US drinks, that's a can of beer, um, a five ounce glass of wine, or a shot, one and a half ounce shot, um, so it's not those gigantic, lovely Bordeaux glasses of wine that you see on TV that probably hold about three glasses of wine in them. Um, that that was going up, again, across all demographics, but again, in women and minorities, we were seeing greater increases and also seeing increases here amongst the youth. But the really scary graphic was this one. So this is alcohol use disorder, and this is effectively addiction. So this is alcohol addiction. Um, this is the most severe form of alcohol misuse, and what you're seeing here are the same trends. You're seeing across all age groups, across all strata, it goes up. Um, this blue mark should be NISARC-3, my apologies, but this is the third wave of the NISARC study. And again, we see women had an increase of 80%, whereas men had an increase of 30%, though again, men, men make up the bulk of this, but women are catching up by drinking more like men. They're drinking in this heavy way, the way that we've seen men drink. Um, and the really scary st uh, uh, statistic here is the, is the young people. So here we're seeing almost one in five Almost one in five young people here, we're seeing these increases um, having an alcohol use disorder. And so this is really alarming data because it suggests that this wave of ALD that we're seeing now that I showed you in the first few slides is the tip of the iceberg. You know, it takes a while to get cirrhosis from heavy drinking. It may not take a while to get alcoholic hepatitis if you're heavily drinking for just a few months, but this is, we're gonna start seeing even more of this. So I don't anticipate that this is really going to abate at all in the, um, in the near term future. Um, and just in general for alcohol use disorder, we are seeing the mortality rise. Um, I'm not sure what's happening here in South Carolina and, and the Carolinas. If anybody's from there and knows why they have lower mortality, let me know. But, um, but across much of the country, we're seeing rises in alcohol use disorder mortality. And, much, and some of that is actually mortality due to liver disease that we're seeing there. So why is this happening? Why are we seeing ALD rise? Why are we seeing this cirrhosis and ALCAP go up in such a way? 
Obesity is also on the rise, and there is data to suggest that if you have one liver disease, like NAFLD or NASH, if you have metabolic syndrome, diabetes, that you may be more prone to getting alcoholic cirrhosis if you drink. And alcoholic hepatitis may actually be more severe in folks who have obesity, who are drinking heavily. And we've all seen these curves, or these graphs, of course, that we see the obesity rates really rising. And when we look at this by uh, racial and ethnic minorities uh, breakdown, we see that these graphs look even worse for African Americans and Hispanics. So we see even higher rates of obesity for certain racial and ethnic groups in this country, um, which also has implications for rates of ALD and uh, rates of alcoholic hepatitis. And when you have alcohol use and you have these features of metabolic syndrome, you can certainly see more advanced alcohol-related cirrhosis. So this is one, um, one of the better studies in this, uh, in my opinion. This was from um, Scandinavia, where they have large kind of cradle-to-grave uh, healthcare databases because of their national health insurance, so they can really follow people from birth all the way to death um, and see what exactly is going on. And so what they found was that if you had higher waist circumference and you drank kind of across, uh, across your, uh, your, as your dose increased, your risk of having complex and advanced liver disease went up as well. And it was even worse for diabetes. So those who had diabetes started off with a much uh, a higher risk of having advanced ALD. And then as their consumption of alcohol use per day rose, so did their risk of alcohol-related liver disease consequences. Um, for reference, about 14 grams of alcohol is in one drink. So when you're seeing, you know, about a 50 gram, that's a roughly about four drinks. You can think of it that way. So we're seeing rising rates of metabolic syndrome in the U.S., rising rates of obesity, including in young people, more diabetes. So this could be part of the reason why, in addition to the increased alcohol use, we're seeing more ALD. We also have, as I mentioned, the hep C epidemic that's getting better and better, but the al alcohol use epidemic has the potential to kind of undo some of, the, some of the good that has been done with direct acting antivirals. And we know that when people have an alcohol use disorder and hep C, they have worse liver disease. It's kind of like gasoline on a fire if they have active hep C and, um, and alcohol use. And this study that looked at um, uh, patients in British Columbia, New South Wales, and Australia, and then Scotland, found that pretty clearly if you had AUD, you had a younger age at decompensation if you had hepatitis C, so you were sicker earlier, um, and that you also had a much greater attributable fraction of decompensation to alcohol depending upon where you were. Um, certainly Scotland and the United Kingdom has seen, has had even worse issues with alcohol and have been very proactive um, in dealing with it. So again, this could potentially undo the advantages of direct acting antiviral therapy. So we treat our patients, we cure their hep C, but if they have cirrhosis, we also have to be thinking about whether or not they are drinking. Because if we cure it and then they go on to need a transplant anyway because we didn't catch the alcohol use, we may not have done them that much good. So in the ALD guidance that was just released um, that uh, Dr. Lucy was an author on, as, as, was, as was I, um, we, rec we issued recommendations about what should you do if you have comorbid liver disease. So if you have diabetes and NAFLD, what do you tell people about how much alcohol they should be drinking? Because this is almost certainly a part of the ALD epidemic, that people have underlying metabolic syndrome and they are still drinking heavily. And so people who have no liver disease can drink potentially safe levels at that one for women, two for men, though there is some data that's suggesting even that may need to come down, that that may be too high. But that those who have ALD and other liver diseases, particularly NAFLD, NASH, viral hepatitis, really need to be counseled that there's no safe level of drinking that we can recommend at this time. But the most important factor in long-term survival for people who have um, particularly advanced ALD is alcohol cessation. This is bar none the most important thing that we do for them. Can adjust their ascites medications and make sure they get their varices screening and their HCC screening and vaccinations, and that's all very important. But it is crystal clear from the literature that if we want to save these people's lives, we have to help them stop drinking. And it is stop. Cutting down is good, but stopping is what actually helps save their lives. And this is why. Um, so this was d uh, data from acute alcoholic hepatitis, a, a group in France with Alexandre Louvet that's published broadly about this. Um, it has large cohorts of patients who have alcoholic hepatitis, that more severe inflammatory um, condition with heavy alcohol use that has very high mortality, 50% at three months, 
75% if they're not responding to prednisolone. And what they found was that in the cohort that did survive the first six months, whether because they survived on their own or because they got prednisolone and survived, if they had any alcohol, their risk of mortality doubled. So one to, two, one to 29 grams is about one to two drinks a day. If they were drinking at that level, it doubled their risk of death, and it just went up from there. So the message is very clear, certainly for ALKEP patients, any amount of alcohol is going to potentially is going to increase their risk of death. And is that because one drink a day is really inflaming the liver that much? Probably not, but one drink in patients who have alcohol use disorders tends to lead to more. Um, so the harm reduction model of just drink a little bit less and that's good enough for patients who have advanced ALD is not really the message that we want to send, though certainly if patients can't stop and need to cut back first, that's better than nothing, but we really want abstinence. And the same thing holds for cirrhosis. So if you don't have acute alcoholic hepatitis but you do have cirrhosis, most patients with ALKEP will have underlying cirrhosis based on biopsy studies, but if you just have cirrhosis, and again, if you're drinking anything, you're gonna, especially if you're a woman, you're gonna have an increased risk of death, almost double the risk of mortality. And it's important to remember, too, that women are not the same as men when it comes to alcohol use. So women process alcohol differently as a consequence of different body composition, um, different metabolic uh, parameters within the liver that can metabolize alcohol. And so alcohol has a greater effect at the same dose in women than in men. Some patients don't understand this. So some patients have a misconception about drinking, that women have to drink more than men, that women don't become alcoholics. They don't have this problem. So it's important to assess for that and make sure that we correct that in our patients. But if you look here at the same dose of alcohol here, 24 to 36 grams, excuse me, 36 to 48 grams, there's a near double risk of death from alcohol use. So really important that the message be for all of our patients with al alcoholic cirrhosis and ALCAP that they don't drink at all. Um, and after transplant, obviously, we're very focused on this. We want to make sure our patients who are transplanted for ALD don't drink, though the best prospective study suggests that 50% will consume some alcohol at some point after their transplant. That's half of a very highly selected, highly counseled, very, uh, very well treated population. So what happens after they drink um, is that they drink heavily, they have a severe relapse with or without recurrent alcoholic cirrhosis. That's what the RAC means right here. Even without it, they have worse survival, but with recurrent alcoholic cirrhosis, their survival drops off dramatically. And look at how quickly that can happen. You can get recurrent alcoholic cirrhosis within five years after a transplant if you're drinking heavily. Um, so if patients think that they're gonna get another 20 to 30 years on this new liver, so it doesn't matter if they drink afterward. That's not true. As in many cases, recurrence of disease after a transplant can sometimes provoke faster destruction of the graft and faster fibrosis than it did before. Um, so it's important in all these phases to know that alcohol needs to be stopped. So what is a standard drink, as I talked about? Um, knowing what the doses are so you can counsel your patients about what is about what a drink looks like is very important. Um, so this is from the NIAAA. Um, a can of beer, and again, this is about beer that's about 5% alcohol. A lot of our IPAs right now have much higher alcohol content than just this, than just a standard regular can of beer. Um, about a five ounce gla uh, uh, glass of table wine, about one and a half shots of um, 80 proof um, spirits constitute one drink. Um, and there's not a lot of understanding about what one drink is. So um, misestimation studies have been done in patients um, asking them to pour out what do you think one drink is. And we have the, the, the kind of lore that says whatever they tell you, double it. That's about right. It's about 1.8 times more than what an actual drink is that they pour out in these studies. So the old kind of saw that we hear in residency training, uh, double it, is, is actually not too far off, at least based upon, based upon the evidence. And so we see a lot, if you look around, and I have this habit of looking around for alcohol paraphernalia wherever I go because I find it very interesting where I see it, including in hospital gift shops, right? So take a stroll through your hospital gift shop and see how much, I, I will cop to it, Michigan has it. Um, there is a lot of alcohol paraphernalia in, in alcohol gift shops. There's a lot of alcohol paraphernalia in places that you wouldn't even think. So you're, I'm going into, you know, Pottery Barn or something, and you see a glass there that says wine is cheaper than therapy. Like, so that's sending a message, right, that it's okay to drink, and that's okay to drink over your emotions, et cetera, and that's, and that's fine to do. And we see this message really a lot. Kind of a funny story. 
um, I live in a small town, or I'm from a small town in Wyoming, um, and uh, my mother works in the hospital as a volunteer in the hospital gift shop. And I walked in there the other day to visit her when I was home, and there was a purse at, in the hospital gift shop that was a wine purse. So it was a purse that had a spigot on it, and you could put like a like a like a plastic bladder in it and fill it up with wine and then just have this little wine purse. And I told my mom her next job was to get that out of that hospital gift shop. <laughs> that was her task for the year. Um, so the other challenge here is that um, for those of us who do research, if we want to do broad international based studies, is that these this is different. So what is considered grams of alcohol in a standard drink is different depending upon where you go. Um, the World Health Organization has has uh, released some new findings about a new way of potentially grading risk of drinking that looks at risk levels um, in standard drinks and also in grams of alcohol that still needs a bit more validation. It was validated, but maybe a better way of doing this. So when we think about diagnosing drinking, again, you can't, you can't help your patient stop drinking if you don't know that they're drinking. So if we don't know that they're actually, uh, actually drinking, we can't really help them. Um, so how do we diagnose it? So everybody in, who's basically getting kind of any, touched by any clinic in any part of the healthcare system really should be routinely screened using validated questionnaires. And I know the VA actually does this quite well with audit C's regularly with their patients. Um, but the audit C is what's recommended by our guidelines and also by most of the addiction societies as a really quick, well-validated way to pick up risky drinking. And then you can go forward into you know, more in-depth questioning to determine what they're actually doing with that. Um, alcohol biomarkers we also recommend to be used. Um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine recommends using alcohol biomarkers as an aid to diagnosis. Um, and what we recommend within this is really urine ethyl glucuronide um, and phosphatidyl ethanol. So we'll talk a little bit more about these because I think these are an important part of our diagnostic armamentarium. Um, urinary ethyl glucan ethyl sulfate are direct alcohol metabolites. So unlike AST to ALT ratios, GGT levels, macrocytosis, which are indirect, um, really not specific markers of alcohol use. These are specific to alcohol use. So they are direct alcohol biomarkers. They are breakdown products of alcohol through those enzymes. I'm going to let you read this. Um, and they are found in urine, blood, and hair, but mostly we use the urine. Um, hair ethyl gluc actually can get alcohol use back several months, but it requires a pretty good chunk of hair. So we don't use that a lot because we don't want our patients to go bald, and I don't think they would appreciate that. Um, they do use that in forensics sometimes, though. Um, so urine, it is excreted in the urine. Um, you can get false positives. So um, if people are diabetic and they have some fermentation in their urine, you might get a false positive. Um, it can be affected by even small amounts of alcohol in foods that are eaten, in you know, cooking products. Um, I had one patient who had a very mild positive who had had like a margarita pie or something that was not cooked. And so it had a little bit in it and it showed up positive. It can be falsely negative. If you have an E. coli UTI, that can also make this falsely negative. But the plus for for us is that it's not affected by advanced liver disease. So this has been validated in studies um, that I'm showing here in both patients who have advanced chronic liver disease and also in the pre and post transplant populations. And it is accurate above certain cutoffs. Really, it's around this kind of 500 or 0.5 milligrams per liter that we consider that to be positive. It gets alcohol use back around about three to five days, um, a little bit longer if they have renal failure. So because it is renally excreted, it can stay positive longer. So you want to be aware of that. Um, ethyl sulfate we use at Michigan as a confirmatory test for a positive ethyl gluc because it does not have the same issues with false positives and false negatives that ethyl gluc does. Phosphatidyl ethanol is a newer biomarker. This is a blood biomarker that is a phospholipid that's produced on red blood cell membranes in the presence of alcohol. Um, it is catalyzed by phospholipase D. Um, and there are differences in metabolism that we'll talk about with this. But the benefit of this is that it gets alcohol use back to about two to three weeks. So it actually functions as kind of a nice biomarker for us because it's also in the blood. Um, occasionally, or not occasionally, actually frequently, um, we will get patients who can't give urine. And People are often aware that drug testing happens by dropping urine, and so they may say, I can't give urine, I don't want to give urine today, but we can get a blood test 
along with their other blood tests to check for alcohol use. So we've been using this quite a bit um, in conjunction with urinary ethyl gluc. There is some validation in ALD patients, which, I, which again I've put here, and it also does not appear to be influenced by liver disease. So um, it needs a bit, probably a bit more validation in that sense, but based on what we know right now, it does not appear to be, um, to be affected by that. And typically we're thinking of anything over about 20 nanograms per ml being positive. So when I think about these biomarkers, I think about them in a yes-no fashion. Um, how much you're drinking can certainly affect the, uh, the level of the biomarker, including the PETH. But as you'll see, as you see here, um, different people, men versus women, um, can have different pharmacokinetics and different processing of the phosphatidylethanol and the PETH. So um, we want to be aware of these inter-individual differences, and that's why when I use this or urinethyl gluc, I think about it as plus minus, yes, no, and then talk to the patient about it. So the key strategy with using biomarkers is that you don't want to make major decisions solely based on a biomarker. So we don't ever remove somebody from the list or not list someone um, or, or anything like that just on the basis of a biomarker. You want to look at the whole picture, talk to the patient. Yeah, we talk to our patients still, right? And we still want to call them, talk to them, find out what happened. Did they have a slip or not? And you can often have, I've often found that biomarkers um, promote candor. So if people know that they're going to be tested, um, they, it may actually be motivational for them to not drink. Um, and interestingly, the data out of recovery programs and substance use treatment programs for physicians and for medical providers has borne this out. These are very intensive programs that require years of therapy and regular biomar alcohol biomarker testing, and they're actually quite effective. So biomarker testing on a regular basis can be motivating for patients when they're having a weak moment knowing they might have to get tested. It can also prompt a more honest discussion about what's happening with their alcohol use and hopefully get around some of the deception that can happen. So what do we do about drinking in ALD? Again, from the guidelines, we want to refer to AUD treatment professionals for people with advanced ALD and alcohol use disorder. And this is really so that they have the full range of alcohol use disorder treatment options, including medications for underlying mental illness. Um, multidisciplinary integrated management is recommended, and in trials, it does improve the rates of alcohol abstinence amongst ALD patients. And there are some real reasons that we'll talk about in a moment when I talk about my clinic at Michigan for why this is really critical for these patients who have advanced ALD. Um, in terms of medications and relapse prevention medications, I won't talk about this a ton. You can certainly ask me about it afterward, but based upon limited data, the only um, medication that has been tested for relapse prevention in advanced ALD is baclofen in um, one, one, maybe two now small randomized trials that have shown some effectiveness. And of the three FDA-approved medications for relapse prevention, which are disulfiram, naltrexone, and acamprosate, acamprosate is the only one that has no evidence of hepatotoxicity. Um, now, Trexone does carry a black box warning for hepatotoxicity, um, but is sometimes used in earlier phases of um, ALD. And disulfiram I have never prescribed because it is clearly hepatotoxic. So for my population who always have advanced ALD, I don't ever use that drug. So alcohol use disorder and mental illness really run together, and this is important for us to know when we think about how to care for these patients, um, because it isn't enough to just tell them to stop drinking and then um, see them back in six months. The heavy alcohol use, the alcohol use disorder is lying over often many other issues, including depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. There is a high rate we're finding of trauma, so emotional, sexual trauma um, from childhood, physical trauma from earlier in life that underlies all of this, and also other drug disorders and nicotine disorders. Also, you can see the odds ratios for this within the 12 months are, are very high for people who have moderate to severe alcohol use disorders. So when we think about how to manage these patients, it's really clear, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't have the experience to manage complex mental health issues and comorbid substance use. So the way to properly manage these patients is with integrated mental health care, absolutely, and bar none but they often don't get this care because I don't want to prescribe psychiatric medications that I'm not familiar with, but my, my psych colleagues are unfamiliar with prescribing an advanced liver disease where hepatic metabolism may be changing and we have to not use certain medications and use other medications and where it becomes very complex. So these patients really fall into, in between the cracks of the system because of that um, and they don't get the treatment that they need. They keep drinking and then they die. And so that's the problem that we're dealing with right now. They are much more complex than just telling them to stop drinking. 
Mental health access, unfortunately, is a major U.S. challenge, and there's lots of reasons for this. Um, certainly, lack of insurance coverage can be an issue. Medicaid has restrictions and has um, poor reimbursement, in many cases, for mental health and substance use, which limits the ability of centers to take on a lot of Medicaid population because they may lose money on them. Um, people have high copays and limits, so you might have coverage for 12 weeks of treatment when what you need is years of tapering treatment. Um, I did some back of the envelope calculations the other day. Um, a 12-week course of Hep C treatment right now runs about fifty to sixty thousand dollars on average. You can buy five years to twenty years of one hour, once a week psychotherapy for the same price but we're often not getting anything close to that kind of coverage within our health insurance systems, and that's a, that's a serious problem. Um, mental health providers have the same problems that we have. There just aren't enough of them, and so that, that access issue becomes a problem. But the logistics of going, lacking time off for appointments, transportation, et cetera, uh, many of the biggest barriers that we find and that I found in my work and my research with these patients is that many of them often don't feel like they need treatment. They have advanced cirrhosis. They've just gotten out of the ICU. Um, they, you go in and you talk to them, and I'm sure you've had the same experience. They, they say, I, can't, I won't drink again. I can't imagine that I would ever drink again, and I believe them. They can't imagine that sitting there yellow and jaundiced and having just gotten out of the ICU that they would ever turn back to alcohol again. And yet many of them will. Some won't, but many will. And so finding the way into that and letting people know that actually going into therapy and helping and getting some alcohol treatment of some type will help prevent that can be a real challenge. Um, for all substance use disordered patients, and this is not just ALD patients, the access to substance use treatment is very low. So utilization is very low at about 11% for all of these reasons. And again, they do really need this, uh, this type of treatment because they, are, they do have fairly significant, highly complex psychosocial issues. So this was data that we published out of the, again, out of the market scan cohort. This is a privately insured cohort. So sort of looking at people who have kind of the best of the best type of insurance. And even with excellent three quarters having mental health coverage uh, and uh, MHSA treatment coverage and 87% having prescription drug coverage, actually rates were quite low. So when you looked at um, FDA approved relapse prevention medication use, it was only about 0.4% of these patients who had alcoholic cirrhosis had any FDA approved medication use. Um, when we looked at non-FDA approved um, medications, which include baclofen, topamax, and gabapentin, gabapentin was obviously the far more prescribed, but it was still only about 3 to 4 percent of the population that had anything like this. I think that in this population they're not getting this really for relapse prevention, but probably because of neuropathy or other reasons. But overall, even in this population that has cirrhosis that has such a clear need for treatment, such a clear mortality benefit to being in alcohol treatment, what we found was that the rates were actually quite low. So at, at uh, one year, only about 10% of them had really had a visit. Um, only about 5 to 6%, or excuse me here, had had any kind of um, medication prescribed. And again, that was mostly gabapentin. So there definitely is some work that we have to do. Um, and there is evidence that when they get this uh, when they get this uh, treatment, they actually have lower rates of decompensation at a year by about 15%. So getting to those compensated patients before they become decompensated with treatment can improve their outcomes. So there are some critical differences that these patients have with respect to your general alcohol use disorder patients. And my eyes were really open to this by talking to my colleagues in psychiatry and psychology and social work who work with our liver disease patients and our transplant patients and how that compares to their work with the general alcohol use disorder population. So if you are a therapist and you're accepting patients, people who come to you will, will sometimes, but not always, be somewhat willing to talk to you, right? They've made the appointment to come and talk to you somewhat of their own accord. However, in transplant and in ALD, they really haven't decided to stop drinking. They just had to. So the decision has really been thrust upon them, either by the transplant process or because they just got too sick to be able to drink again. And so they really are focused on their medical health. That becomes the priority. They're not focused on their psychiatric health. And certainly in transplant, what it often turns into is an almost adversarial relationship with our mental health colleagues because the patient perceives that we're making them go in order to get the transplant, so this is the last sort of hurdle that they have to get through. That person is the last gatekeeper before I can get my transplant. So there can sometimes not be quite the relationship or the alliance that our mental health workers need to really, uh, to really help. 
They don't perceive a need for treatment. Again, they don't think they have an addiction problem and they're not addiction treatment seeking. And these are real big barriers. Um, m most of my patients, when I've spoken with them, don't necessarily want to really accept right away that they have a problem with alcohol that is a chronic problem, that it doesn't necessarily go away, that doing therapy and treatment over time is going to help prevent relapse, but that relapse is still a possibility for many patients. And so that, that barrier to kind of acceptance of the, de of the degree of the problem can sometimes be a real challenge. And again, when they're very focused on their medical health, everybody's very motivated, but when you get a transplant and then kind of move down the road about a year, oftentimes that's when we start to see people get back into their lives, go back to the, what they used to do, and sort of forget you know, forget a lot of what they went through and start to start to drink again. So the new model of thinking about this that we are, you know, putting into play at Michigan is to not just treat the alcohol use disorder and the liver disease at the time of transplant. If you're a transplant patient and you are listed, you get a lot of stuff. You get a lot of care. You get access to mental health professionals. You get access to medical care. You get a lot of support. You have dedicated social workers, dedicated financial people who will help you with insurance. There is a ton of support. If you don't get listed, you get a referral to AA and told to come back in six months. Right? So there's not a lot out there for people who don't get listed for transplant. And this, to me, is wrong. And so it felt uh, incredibly wrong that we were doing this to our patients when the access to mental health care is so critical to them not dying, to their actual survival. So what we decided, uh, what, what uh, the, the, the impetus that we have at Michigan is that ALD patients who don't need or aren't immediate candidates for transplant should have the same access to high quality AUD treatment that mental, mental health care as our listed patients. It should be the same across that continuum because we're not just taking care of a transplanted liver, we're taking care of that patient across the life of whatever liver they have and across their entire life. And so that's what's motivated us to create, the, uh, uh, I think one of the nation's first multidisciplinary ALD clinics. Um, and this is really filling that gap for ALD patients who aren't listed for transplant. This is part of our team. Um, this is our uh, transplant psychiatrist, Scott Winder, who has um, a special interest in ALD care and in um, um, mental health care for ALD patients. Kristen Clevering, who is our addiction social worker. Anne Fernandez, who's a clinical psychologist um, working in alcohol use, who also has a K award in perioperative alcohol management. Um, Jack Buchanan, if there's any med med medical students in the room, um, he was our medical student apprentice. Um, so he, I worked with him on the inpatient ward. He heard about the clinic, wants to go into psychiatry, and has been working with us now for, for the past year since the clinic was formed about uh, in July of 2018, and has really been a great, um, a great resource for our clinic and for our patients. Um, we also have two more individuals who weren't here for the picture, um, Amanda Johnson, who is our, um, our dedicated ALD uh, clinic nurse and my general hepatology nurse on our team, who has done a phenomenal job of kind of taking it upon herself to do motivational interviewing training to be able to speak and help ambivalent patients in between the clinic visits. As we all know, our nursing staff are often the ones that our patients really identify with. When my transplant patients call back in, they're like, where's, where's Patty? You know, they wanna talk to their nurse, they really identify with them, and that's a huge, huge um, point that we can help leverage to help our patients stay off alcohol. There's a, big, there's a big trust relationship with our nursing staff. And then Hila Asifa, who is my clinical research coordinator, who's also been really instrumental in the clinic running. So how does this structure it? Again, we've been running for just a little over a year. We probably have close to about 60 to 65 patients enrolled right now. Um, we, we run the clinic because of time, uh, time and space accommodation issues only every other Monday, though I would love to run it more. Um, we see three new patients and um, a, a few RVs, depending upon who shows up um, every, uh, every day. Um, and we do always do a pre-clinic phone call from our social worker who calls ahead of time to explain what the clinic is, talk about barriers to coming, what might be happening, and make sure we can increase um, our, our completion rate. Um, I'll show you what they get in uh, ALD clinic education packet that we wrote that has information not just about cirrhosis, but also about alcohol use, behavioral health. And when they arrive, they see myself, they see psychiatry, and they'll see either Anne or Kristen. Um, there's a lot of overlap between what Anne and Kristen are doing, and so we elected not to have them see both. Um, and then they also see um, Amanda, who goes over the packet with them and kind of does some additional education. 
Um, we do talk screens at each visit in addition to our labs, so we're getting those behavior, we're getting those biomarkers um, every time we can. Um, and we have patients commit to three sessions with our clinic staff. So in order to get into the clinic, the referral criteria are you have to have advanced liver disease, so alcoholic cirrhosis or ALCHEP. And this was mostly to manage the amount of patients we were going to get. And also because we want patients coming who really need to see a hepatologist. So if you have alcoholic steatosis, you may not really need to see a hepatologist at that point, but you definitely do if you're in that advanced ALD category where your mortality is higher if you're drinking. They have to be drinking within six months, and they also need to be willing to speak to a substance use provider. So they don't have to be 100% willing to, to you know, go full bore and do years of treatment. We can work with ambivalent patients if we have a little bit of willingness. So we say we only need 1% willingness. If we can just get that door, our foot in the door, we can work with people and work with them where they're at to try to get them to abstinence. So we're, we're writing up our data right now for the first year, and we're looking at outcomes for liver-related outcomes, AUD outcomes, and cost value utilization outcomes. The preliminary data, I won't be able to show it to you today because it's not completed, but it does look promising in terms of improvements across the board for those three different outcome categories. Um, so for our ALD clinic, this is just a sampling of, of, the, of the folder that we give them. This is what the cover looks like, um, and we give them some information about cirrhosis, but then we also have, given, have written up some um, information about behavioral health, what is it, you know, what is addiction like? What is, it, what is it like to have this? What should you do? We have about five pages of kind of co lists of coping mechanisms. I'm bored. Here's other things I can do. I'm angry. Here's other things I can do. It's been very helpful. This is roughly what the clinic schedule looks like. So it looks almost like a transplant clinic in many respects where you kind of cycle through the various different patients. And what's really nice about the clinic is that we're all sitting in the same room um, talking about the patients back and forth in between visits. So what often happens is, you know, I'll go in and talk to a patient and then be able to tell Scott or Ann or Kristen something about what, what I heard so that they can leverage that when they go in. Um, Scott will go in and hear that they're very motivated by their liver disease, they're very scared, they're very worried. So I'll spend my time on that when I go in and speak with them. Um, and that's, that works out very well. And I think it unifies our team to the presence of the patient so that they see that the liver doctor is just as important as the psychiatrist, is just as important as the psychologist, that those are all parts of their liver care. It's not just the liver. So demographics for the clinic, mean age is about 47, about half are female to male here. Um, most are Caucasian, which is not unusual given our, the demographics of our population in Michigan. Um, about half are married. Um, private insurance is the bulk of this. We do, um, we do take Medicare and Medicaid within the clinic. Um, we've not had a lot of uh, issues with coverage, interestingly. We've been able to get coverage for the clinic visits, um, which was uh, at, in the beginning a concern since we have two mental health professionals in that clinic, a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Um, and critically, what we've seen is that there's a tremendous amount, almost everyone, so 85 to 90 percent of our patients have a comorbid psychiatric disorder. And this is patients who are getting diagnosed in the right way by a psychiatrist doing a very good granular assessment of all possible um, mental, mental health issues. Um, we do screens at every clinic as well. We do PHQ-9s, GAD-7s, ISIs, Fagerstrom's, all of it, a big uh, battery of behavioral surveys as well. About a third of our patients have trauma, and I think this is something that is new to us in liver to hear about. Certainly not new for our psych colleagues, but the number of patients, the percentage of patients who are dealing with and coping with some very serious trauma issues and using alcohol to cope with that is actually quite high, and particularly for women. And so I think this is something that we need to pay attention to as we move forward, because this, if this isn't dealt with, it's very hard to stop drinking. It's very hard to. Comorbid substance use rates are actually very high. Again, kind of the same numbers. 85 to 90 percent of our patients are dealing with some type of comorbid substance use. So on top of comorbid mental illness, on top of the alcohol use, they also have another substance use disorder, tobacco, marijuana, very high rates now that it's legalized um, in the U.S. or in uh, Michigan, opioids, cocaine, other drugs as well. So that also becomes a complexity. So what are people choosing? Um, we've looked at what they have chosen in the past in the yellow bars. Many people have been in residential therapy. There's a lot of AA. People come in with a lot of exposure to AA. Very few people like it. 
from my experience, though AA is a very good organization and, and some people do respond to it, but many of the patients who come to us really dislike it. We, we, once they leave the clinic, much of what they are doing is one-on-one. -on -one. And this isn't just because they're seeing our, our providers one-on-one, -on -one, but they are choosing to go to one-on-one -on -one counseling when they go back to where they are, um, where their home is. Um, we do a lot of tele, kind of telecare where we're, where we're connecting and interacting with local therapists, et cetera, local counselors, because it can be difficult for patients to make it back to us, as you might imagine, when they live far away. So what are some of the lessons we've learned about a year into this? Um, the first is that, as you might expect, no-shows and cancellations can be a real problem in this population, and this is not unique to our clinic. This is an issue for um, populations with addiction who are, who are connecting with the medical system. So we've started pre-visit calls. Um, we're going to be exploring some predictive overbooking and increasing to four new patients just to increase our ability to see more new patients. You often want to strike while the iron is hot, right? So if you have an inpatient who has ALKEP and they're very motivated to stop, we want to be able to get them into the clinic relatively quickly. Um, Harvard, actually, their addiction services came up with a very novel, um, very interesting approach to addiction treatment with a bridge clinic. So it's staffed, um, I think seven days a week, it might be only five, but it's staffed um, for the full day. And if you want treatment, you go to the bridge clinic. So people who are being discharged from inpatient, people who are in outpatient clinics, they can just call up and go. It doesn't have require an appointment weeks down the road. And that type of an approach is really critical for patients because you got you to get to them when they're ready because a week from now they may not be. Ensuring follow-up and keeping connected to AED treatment. We're doing post-visit check-ins about one in three months and more frequently, instituting our requirement for three sessions, and we're actually starting um, kind of in the process of writing up a CBT curriculum that is specific to ALD, that really capitalizes on the liver disease. Some of the work that I've done with, with um, the patients that I've interviewed and the research that I've done has shown that these patients are very motivated by their liver disease. And so they, they're coming to clinic and they're coming to see me, and so the liver is kind of the hook to get them into the clinic and to get them connected to mental health care. So we're developing a CBT curriculum that's specific to that, that really capitalizes on that, and then expanding our telepsych presence and our telehealth presence as well, which is actually a system-wide um, organizational goal for Michigan Medicine as well. Um, Medicaid coverage at UMet. so unfortunately the addiction treatment services at UM does not take Medicaid. Um, and so that has been a bit of a challenge to get our patients connected to our addiction treatment services. I'm hopeful that that will change. And we have some of our own connections to policy and some, own some of my research that I'm doing that preliminarily is showing some, some very favorable cost effectiveness data in this population for substance use treatment that I'm hoping may move the needle on that. And then always getting reliable data collection. We want our surveys to be collected every time, so those behavioral health surveys, PHQ-9s, those are the vital signs of my mental health colleagues, so getting those each time can be a real challenge, but we're I'm working on automating those and getting some in-clinic tablets. We're still using paper surveys. We're like we're in the, the 19th century using paper, but um, we're trying to move the needle on that a little bit. Um, so very briefly, I did want to talk about kind of what's happening right now with transplant um, and alcoholic hepatitis. So there was recently a large meeting in Dallas that was convened with um, experts in ALD and alcohol use disorder from around the nation to talk about transplanting acute alcoholic hepatitis. So again, these are patients who have very high melds, very severe liver disease from the severe inflammation of heavy alcohol use, usually have cirrhosis underlying this, but frequently have not had that six months of abstinence that we've all heard so much about. So they're drinking very recently, but in highly selected cases can actually do quite well if transplanted. And so this, tra this conference was all about um, should we do this and if so, how? Kind of coming up with some guidance for um, transplant centers who want to do this. And I won't go into a lot of details about this, because that could take up an entire, um, an entire talk on its own. But um, several of the issues that we, that we talked about, that we convened on and kind of came to agreement on, is that we really need to be standardizing how we report this and how we audit this and having real transparency in what those criteria are for centers to be transplanting these very sick patients with recent drinking and minimal abstinence. And that the six-month rule should really not be used as a criterion for transplant. And I think this is, this is really key, is that there is little to minimal to no data that supports the six months being some type of magic number that says they definitely are not going to relapse or they definitely are. There's a lot more to it than that, um, that our addiction colleagues are assessing in a much more complicated, nuanced, and sophisticated fashion. And I think our field is now catching up to that nuance on sophistication by eliminating this as a criterion for ALKEP transplant. I think that should also be eliminated and is being eliminated for all 
alcohol, alcoholic liver disease transplant, not just for um, ALCAP. So the suggested listing criteria for ALCAP that, were, that have actually been published now, and were just published a couple of weeks ago in liver transplant, is that this be the first liver decompensating event, which as we talked about yesterday at GI Grand Rounds, can be sometimes a little bit difficult to discern um, if they were ever, ever had anything before or were ever told. They needed to have failed prednisolone, which is the, the, the one medical treatment that we have that has, does have uh, uh, some evidence for benefit. Um, that a psyche valve be able to be performed. So this means the patient has to be awake, able to talk to you, not intubated, not so altered that you can't have a meaningful conversation. Um, when that gets ignored and when we've not been able to do this, sometimes patients are chosen that might have uh, features that make them more prone to early relapse and graft loss. They need to accept their diagnosis, commit to the diagnosis and to the treatment course in addition to their family committing to sobriety. They need to have at least two close supportive family or friends. This could also be just close supportive friends as well. Have a good psychosocial assessment. Again, a little hand wavy on that one, but that gives us room for our psychosocial colleagues to do their full assessment and weigh in all of those factors about whether it's positive or negative. Um, no more than one failed maximal rehab attempt. So this is failure of maximal AUD treatment. So what is that? That's residential therapy or in intensive outpatient therapy. So it's not going to AA and drinking again. It's not doing a few counseling sessions and drinking again. It's did you get maximal AUD treatment? If somebody got interferon monotherapy for hep C and failed, we wouldn't call them a full treatment failure. We would give them the best treatment and then see what happened. And that's what we're talking about here, is did they get the best treatment and did they fail that? And then considering if they're too high risk. No other active substance use disorder, and then absence of an uncontrolled psychiatric disorder is also very important. So, um, so that was recently published in Liver Transplantation. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. It's kind of really starting, a, starting and codifying a conversation about how we should do transplant for these advanced ALCAT patients. Um, this will probably certainly change as the years go on as we get more experience and more prospective trials. So in conclusion, ALD and AUD rates are really rising in the U.S. and constitute a true epidemic that has kind of been a little bit overshadowed by some of the opioid epidemic and some of the other diseases of despair, but no less serious and no less important. Um, alcohol cessation is the one thing that saves the lives of these patients with advanced ALD. So if we do nothing else for them but help them get connected to treatment and stop alcohol, we will have done a lot. Um, and multidisciplinary integrated care is really necessary. These patients are extraordinarily psychosocially complex, and so the recognition of that and putting in place systems level, ability, systems level ways of getting them connected in an integrated fashion is really critical to saving their lives. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Yes. I'm back. Yes. Um, my question is, uh, what is the role uh, of, uh, you talk about the team, mm -hmm. and it sounded like you're trying to care for the old person, mm -hmm. you know, and the VA, they've been talking about old health. Yeah. And I'm a chaplain, mm -hmm. so I did not see any involvement of chaplains on your team. Oh, that's a great so my idea. My question <laughs> is, what is the role of chaplain to meet this need? And hmm. an observation, based on the work that I've been doing over mm -hmm. the years, there is this tension between behavioral modification mm -hmm. and transformation. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, it sounds like the treatment we're trying to provide is to try to modify this behavior, whether it's drinking and addiction. Mm -hmm. But underneath all of these um, symptoms, what people are longing for is to experience mm -hmm. transformation, a change. Mm -hmm. And I have seen the effect of uh, dealing with some of those underlying issues um, mm -hmm. as a chaplain. So I just want to know, what are your thoughts? Do you see that mm -hmm. tension there between behavioral modification and transformation? And then also with what you presented, you know, I came in a little bit late, mm -hmm. but uh, are there roles for chaplains on your team in caring for these mm -hmm. people? Right, that's a great idea. I think you're absolutely right that a lot. Oh, 
Oh, sorry. So the question is, um, is there a role for chaplains um, on the team in terms of um, going beyond just behavior modification into more of a transformation, personal, personal transformation? And I think you're absolutely right. There definitely is. Um, this is what you hear patients talk about. I mean, we can do behavior modification techniques, and they do work, um, but many patients talk about this more transformative aspect. And, and oftentimes, to be totally honest, we don't affect that, right? We're there to support, but there's something else that has happened in their lives that has made them want to stop and now we're here to help support that but the transformative aspect of what they're doing has kind of already happened or happened outside of the clinic walls and I think it would be a great idea to get chaplains involved because that is very much a part of durable abstinence it really is trans a transformation when you talk to patients who are in Alcoholics Anonymous um, that's often what they talk about so they talk about and that's what AA really plays you know that's part of what they talk about and part of what they do or the big part is a spiritual transformation right um, it is about that personal transformation. And so patients who connect to AA and connect to that model do often talk in those terms. So I think a chaplain would be a fantastic addition. I know where their office is, too. I'm going to go ahead up there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I laud the um, efforts for your interdisciplinary group uh, mm -hmm. to try to address the whole, perfect, whole, whole issue. Right. Um, we know that uh, integrated care can look many different ways, mm -hmm. and just geographic co-location of, of disciplines doesn't always necessarily mean integration. Mm -hmm. right. um, there is the, uh, this role for transdisciplinary care, which means people cross-train each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, to what extent has your group considered you know, the cross-training of mental health kind of skill sets into your practice? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do that actually. So um, we actually talk about cross training. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting the question. Um, he's asking uh, to what extent do we cross train one another in disciplines? So you can certainly have multidisciplinary care, but it's almost like just parallel play, right? You're just kind of sitting next to each other, doing your thing, but not actually crossing into each other's uh, into each other's um, disciplines and learning about psychiatry or psychiatry, learning about hepatologies, etc. Um, I would say within our clinic, we actually are doing that fairly well. So part of how we've structured the clinic is to provide these types of, of cross-training um, uh, opportunities. So uh, not necessarily formalized all the time, but I've done motivational interviewing training. So I go to American Consult Liaison Psych conferences and speak there. I'll be at ASAM, I'll be at American Psychiatric Association, I'll be at RSA. And we're starting to see more of this where we're talking to each other about okay, how do you think about liver disease? Let me tell you about liver disease as a psychiatrist so that you can think about you know, how this impacts your practice and how it impacts the medications that you use. So I think you're absolutely right, that kind of that cross-training and people getting away from super hyper-specialization, you know, I'm a left lobe hepatologist, don't talk to me about the right lobe kind of thing. Um, that getting away from that kind of a model into, to where we are more generalists in a way, I think is actually really important. So yeah, we definitely are doing that in the clinic and I'd love to see more of that. Mm -hmm. There's surprisingly little cross-pollination between our societies, like the ASLD, the APA, ACLP, RSA. Like, I don't see as much of it as I would like to see, because, given that all of the issues with ALD are around alcohol. Right? Like we, should, we had a day and a half conference on acute alcoholic hepatitis in Dallas, and guess how many speakers we had from psychiatry? One. One. And all of the issues with this are in the field of psychosocial care. And so we really need to see more of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, two questions. Yeah. Um, you showed a slide where I think you said 20 or 30% of your patients had trauma. Mm -hmm. And it was higher than Yeah. My question is, the first question, how, what is it in women? And mm -hmm. do you know the components of trauma specifically? Mm -hmm. You know, domestic violence, sexual violence, whatever. <coughs> Yeah. Oh, did you want me to answer the first one? Okay. Yeah. Sure. So she asked, what were the com what were the components of the trauma for our patients? I don't know the exact breakdown of it. Just off the top of my head, we've seen physical trauma, a lot of sexual trauma, um, and then also kind of emotionally traumatic events from childhood. But the mix of those those types of things, I'm not exactly certain of. But it does tend to be more in our women as well. So higher than. Oh no! The to I mean, the total number within within the group is about thirty percent. So <laughs> I don't off the top of my head exactly. Yeah. The second question is: You said about fifty percent of people don't like AA. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it boil, it's, an, it's a number of different reasons. The first is, oh, so why don't people like AA? Um, so the first is a lot of people don't like being in group therapy. So they're either socially anxious or they're just not comfortable being around other people talking about their experiences. You'll hear people say a lot that they don't, they don't like the hearing about kind of other people's necessarily alcohol experiences. They feel like it turns into what they call a drunkalogue, you know, where they're just kind of talking about, you know, their, the fun times they had when they were drinking. When people come from smaller towns, um, it actually isn't anonymous. And so that's come up several times is that we say we'll go to AA, but in fact, they're going to see people that they know at AA, so they don't want to do that. So the spiritual component, interestingly, has not been a big part of why people at least have told me they didn't like it. It was really a lot more like some of it kind of, I don't want to be around those kind of people. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's that aspect of privacy, of stigma. Um, it could be a partial aspect of I don't want to identify myself at that stage as someone like this. Um, too, but in, but really, it's it's about kind of groups and and anxiety and groups and not wanting other people to know that they have this problem, that type of thing. Okay. Any other questions? Come on up to the front. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.